Thank you for your interest in this West Virginia School of Preaching Victory Lectureship being done virtually this year. We certainly hope you enjoy these lectures on the Book of Romans, chapters 12 through 16. Welcome to this hour of our lectureship. We'll be uh, have a song and then we'll be led in prayer by Mike Bisson and then we'll have our introduction of Glenn Hawkins. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases, no, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles, he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour, Father, um, asking you to be with the speaker, Brother Glenn, as he uh, presents our lesson this morning. Father, we pray that you would be with us. Pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the, this lesson. We pray, Father, that you would be with Brother Glenn as he presents this. Father, we ask now, forgive us of all of our wrongdoings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next speaker is Glenn Hawkins. He was born in 1943. He, he has been a preacher uh, for many years. Glenn, Glenn has graduated from... Uh, uh, Newark High School in Ohio. He has also graduated from Ohio Valley College with a degree in Bible. He went on to Harding University and got his bachelor's degree in Bible and then went on to Harding Graduate School of Religion in 1975 and also has a master's degree in philosophy. After having done located work in Missouri and Tennessee, Glenn has served as a preacher for the Maslin, Ohio Church of Christ from 1975 to 2015, and he still serves there as a part-time basis. Glenn is married uh, to Hope, and they have two sons, Kenneth and, and his wife, George, Georgia, and Susan and, and their 15-year-old daughter, Addison. Adam lives in Maslin. Glenn serves on the editorial board of Sufficient Evidences in a journal published by the Warren Apologetic Center. We are so happy that Glenn has come and agreed to be on our lectureship this year, and we look forward to his message. I want to express my appreciation to the elders here and to the School of Preaching Lectureship Committee for the invitation to speak on this lectureship on the Book of Romans. Romans has long been a favorite book of mine in the New Testament. The assignment given to me, the receiving of the week, is from the passage from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 8, which I read as follows. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat and let not him who eats does not let him who does not eat judge him who eats for God has received him who are you to judge another man's servant to his own master he stands or falls 
Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, and he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Beginning with Romans 14, verse 1, and continuing through Romans 15 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul deals with our relationship with our brethren in the church. All of us come from different backgrounds and even beliefs. In the first century, there were Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians coming together in the body of Christ. Problems arose in the first century church as these two groups from contrasting backgrounds were trying to be one in Christ. As Paul states in the opening verse in this chapter, there are those he styled as strong brothers and those he styled as weak brothers. Wayne Jackson commented as follows, This segment deals with relationships between the weak and the strong. The weak are those who have a lesser level of spiritual knowledge, and the strong are those more mature in the faith. The weak have not yet discerned the difference between expediencies and doctrine, and may be inclined to be argumentative. Patience is to be exercised with the weak as they learn, but they must not be allowed to take control to the disruption of Christian unity." Unquote. Paul's point, as I understand it, was that both the strong and the weak must learn to get, a, uh, get along together with each other despite these differences. Now, I think it's important to understand what these differences were. Let it be said that the matters that are dealt with in our text are not matters of faith, salvation, or doctrine. In these matters, there must be unity. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Later on, in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Paul gets a little more specific when he writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. These are matters that there must be unity. They are not matters of opinion or indifference. The New King James Version translates verse 1 as follows, Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. The King James has doubtful disputations. The New American Standard Version has passing judgments on his opinions. The English Standard Version says quarrelsome over opinions. The Modern Language Bible has do not criticize his views. And the New International Version has disputable matters. The phrase in Greek here is diakrisis dialogissimum. The first word means passing judgment or condemnation. The second word means thoughts or opinions about certain matters. I want to emphasize that these are matters of conscience or opinion or indifference. For example, the weak brother has certain opinions or scruples about things he cannot do 
in all good conscience, even though God has not specifically approved or condemned. But the weak brother has such strong conviction on these matters that he would not do something because he would violate his conscience. Brother Roy Deaver points out, it is significant that each of these words is preceded by the Greek negative, me or may, and that each of these words is present active imperative. The force of this is quit, cease. The brothers under consideration here were in the habit of doing the things which are here denounced, and they are told to stop it, unquote. Instead, Paul says, the strong brother is told to receive one who is weak in the faith. The word translated, receive or accept, is in the present middle imperative, literally meaning keep on receiving or taking to yourselves and is a command. We don't have a choice in that matter. We receive that brother, though he is weak. In verse 2, we note that one man has the faith that he can eat all things, meat included. And another man has the faith that he can eat only vegetables or herbs. Now, the one who can eat all things is styled the strong brother. The one who can eat only vegetables or herbs is called the weak brother. One question raised at this point is whether Paul is referring to Jewish Christians coming out of Judaism or Gentile Christians coming out of a pagan background. Paul himself does not specify here about whom he is talking, Jew or Gentile. But it could be that the strong brother who can eat meat could refer to a Jewish Christian who has fully comprehended the fact that no meat is unclean and thus he can eat meat. Or the strong brother could be a Gentile Christian who can eat meat despite its origin. The weak brother could be a Jewish Christian who hasn't quite separated himself from the law of Moses and its teachings about unclean meats. The weak brother could also be a Gentile Christian who still has qualms about eating meat that may have been used in the sacrifice to idols. Now, Jesus himself taught in Mark 7, 19, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Paul elaborated on this in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 4 when he said, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And yet, despite that teaching, some Christians still had some scruples about eating meat and chose only to eat vegetables. Paul's point here is just how the strong and weak brother are to treat each other. And Paul's answer is given in verse 3. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. And here's the important thing, for God has received him. The phrase despise, or the King James uses set at naught, comes from a Greek word which means to make light of, to despise, to treat with contempt and scorn, or to reject with contempt. So we find that the strong brother was not to despise or to treat with contempt and scorn or to make fun of the weak brother. On the other hand, the weak brother was not to judge the strong brother. The word judge in the Greek text here is krino, which means to assume sensorial power over. The word used here is in a negative sense and refers to the kind of judging that only belongs to God. It's the kind of judging that refers to criticizing, fault-finding, or condemning. Neither one is to engage in those activities. And Paul explains the reason why that's the case. He says, for God has received him. What does that mean? That means both the strong brother and the weak brother have been accepted by God into his family. And because of that, each should receive the other. 
Once again, I want to emphasize that we're talking about matters of opinion or conscience, not matters of obligation, faith, and doctrine. We're not talking about baptism for the remission of sins. We're not talking about instrumental music or a host of other doctrinal issues. We're talking about matters of opinion, matters of conscience. And Paul says God has accepted both the strong brother and the weak brother because they are in Christ. Burton Kaufman commented on this. He wrote, any questions arising from the scruples men observe in private lives and not resulting in the violation of Christ's commandment is by such definition secondary and of minor importance. The sad part about it is in the church, there have been a lot of divisions over matters of indifference and matters of opinion, and it shouldn't be that way. Now, Paul continues in verse four by saying, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. This further emphasizes the fact that the strong and the weak brother are not to judge or condemn or to treat with contempt or scorn one another. Why? Because both the strong and the weak are servants of God and answerable to him and not to each other. If God has accepted the strong and the weak, who are we not to do likewise? God will make the final judgment. Paul now goes on to deal with another example of the strong and the weak. Notice verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully persuaded or convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it. Brother David Roper in his commentary on Romans wrote this. Another word or two should be said about the position of the strong brother on this matter. The New American Standard Version and the New King James Version says that he regards every day alike. Now the wording might leave the impression that the strong brother considered every day as ordinary. That he thought no day was special. Perhaps it would be an aid to our understanding if we left off the word alike, which is not in the original text. It was added by the translators. This leaves us with regards every day. Now, the word regards is from Crino, which in this case means to approve or esteem. The meaning of Romans 14, 5 in this case is that every day is regarded as sacred. Now, someone might point out, well, there's a special uh, day of the week that's important to Christians. That's the first day of the week. And I agree with that. But if we don't regard with esteem the other days, I think we're going to have trouble regarding the first day as sacred and holy as well. Let me emphasize again that the esteeming of one day above another is not a matter of doctrine, but a matter of conscience, indifference or opinion. Now, at first glance, Paul may be referring to Jewish Christians who continued to hold certain days and feasts prescribed by the law of Moses. But Paul does not identify in the text who these are. Now, if it is, if it is Jewish Christians, Paul has dealt with this matter in Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. Notice what he said there. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God's, he did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul here condemns the observance of these feast days as a matter of salvation. Or if it's a Gentile, the same thing. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. You know, the Gentiles had certain feasts and special days as well. But observing them as a matter of salvation would indeed be sinful. But let's suppose that a Jewish person today would decide to become a Christian. 
knowing that the law of Moses had been taken out of the way as a means of salvation and justification. Could this person continue to observe the Sabbath, Saturday, as a day he refrained from working or to read and study the Bible on his own? I don't think anybody would deny that he couldn't do it. You know, even after his own conversion, Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. We read this in Acts 20 and verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because I would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Well, why was he going there? As a matter of salvation? Well, I think he went there because he knew a lot of his Jewish brethren would be there and have a chance to preach the gospel to them. And then there's an interesting example of this in Acts 21 that gives a lot of people trouble. Beginning at verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, that's the Lord's brother, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which are believed, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, and that all may know those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou, that thou walkest orderly and keepest the law. And touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written, concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be made for every one of them. Been a lot of questions about this incident in the life of Paul. A lot of uh, conclusions have been drawn. And many of them, I think, are false. If Paul did wrong here, if he did wrong, where is the rebuke? And who rebuked him? Don't forget, the book of Galatians had been written by this time. Do you remember Galatians chapter 2? When Paul confronted Peter? Because he was associating with the Gentiles. And when certain Jewish Christians came in, he disassociated himself. And even Barnabas was carried along. And Paul rebuked him to his face. Once again, if Paul did wrong here, if he actually sinned in doing so, where is the rebuke? Well, there isn't any. After looking at this passage and seeing what others have written, I believe that Paul was using expediency here. You know, on one occasion, he had Timothy circumcised. On another occasion, he refused to have Titus circumcised for different reasons. With Titus, because that would signify that it was a matter of salvation. Timothy was a matter of expediency so that he might uh, be able to associate with his Jewish brethren and have more uh, influence with them. And I think that's exactly what Paul did here. Once again, the question is, if he sinned, who rebuked him? Well, there isn't any answer. Let's suppose that you're studying with a Muslim. And he is converted to Christ. And as a Muslim, he devotes the day of Friday as a day of prayer. If he decides that he wants to continue to devote Friday to a day of prayer and meditation, could he do it? I think he could. The only difference would be he's not praying to Allah. He's praying to the God of the Bible. Now, later on, he may change his mind. If a Roman Catholic is converted to Christ, could he still refrain from eating meat on a Friday and eat only fish? Though I can't see much difference. Certainly so, as long as he doesn't try to bind that on Christians. 
And if he is sincere in that belief, who am I to grab him after he comes out of the baptistry and says, on Friday, let's go, home, let's go and have a steak dinner. There may come a time when he may learn better and his conscience will not be offended if he eats steak on Friday. We are to bear with the weak brethren. If I or anyone would want to set aside a certain day, say Thursday, for prayer and Bible study, can I still do it? Certainly so. But I could not say, well, every Christian has to do so. Notice verse 6. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. And Paul concludes in verse 5, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. In other words, do what you think is right. Paul then concludes in verses 7 and 8, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. You know, before we became Christians, we like to do things that would just benefit ourselves. But as Christians now, our concern is loyalty to the Lord. We live for the Lord and we will die to the Lord. But the guy Orbison Jr. commented on this. Now, the point is that if that is the case, that we live and die for the Lord, then that explains why a person does what he does regarding the calendar or in his decisions to not eat meat. He's doing it because he believes that that is what the Lord wants him to do. So he's following his conscience in the opinions he practices, and therefore we should not condemn him. You know, the church will always have those who are strong and those who are weak. That'll never change. Paul says our obligation is to accept both because God has accepted them. The time may come when the weak brother will become strong and thus can do things that will not violate his conscience. But let's all work together to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4 and verse 3. Thank you very much. We thank the speaker of this hour for providing us that lesson. We thank you for your interest in the Word of God. If you'd like to study the Bible more or learn more about us, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah.